Welcome to the podcast today. My name is Douglas Gabriel. I'm here with Michael McKibben, and we are continuing our conversations, which are part of a set called um, Interviews with an Exorcist, but we like to call this Questions for an Exorcist, or perhaps Stump, Stump the, the Chump. Chump. Yeah, that's my yeah. favorite title for it. <laughs> Let's see if we can ask him a question uh, that he just cries and runs away respectfully from. Respectfully, Stump the Chump. Yeah, I totally respect. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> So anyway, these conversations have been great. People have liked them, so we're continuing them. Michael had some more questions, which I, I like that they're impromptu, so I can just give you the straight-from-the-gut answer. So what questions do you have today, Michael? Hey, if, if you're prepared, I can't stump you. So this is why I made notes, because ah. I told you about these. Okay, so what I would like to ask you about is institutional corruption. There's a lot of talk about that today because of this new uh, indictment of uh, Donald Trump. And there's a lot of call for reform of the judicial system, reform of the Department of Justice, the FBI, the Department of State, yada, yada, yada. New new calls for reform. And, And we've got various candidates that are out there saying, well, if I'm president, I will make sure we reform that. Now, uh my question to you is this let me preface it a little bit because i have a personal example of how reforms were called for and absolutely nothing happened and that was when we discovered through uh discovery uh, of judicial watch into hillary's email system that we proved that hillary cut a contract as secretary of state and in the state department in 2009 with Facebook for a template for winning elections. Now, that is proven unequivocal evidence that came right out of the GSA's records, which, by the way, the GSA had blocked. And the only actual evidence of that was in Hillary's own email system. So here we we put out all of that information and we very laid it out really well and put it in the Miller Act notice, which we submitted to President Trump when he was president. And it was absolute proof of corruption in these different institutions. And guess what we heard in response? Crickets, perhaps? The very word I was going to say. We heard crickets. We have not had one person step up. Well, we have had some. But in terms of major institutional people, We've had none of them step up and and uh, try to protect our interests as citizens. And I'm hearing the same talk today that uh, they're going to reform the system. And so what I want to ask you about, Douglas, is this. You have talked a lot about how a sin becomes a law, becomes demon possession. And I wonder if you could walk us through that and tell us what you think about can these institutions that we are observing now be reformed or do they need to be destroyed? Uh, destroyed, dismantled, whatever word you want to use. Well, first off, these are now demonic institutions and you can't stop a demon institution that is basically supported by laws unless you rescind the law or pass okay, another can, law that supersedes walk, that. Walk us through this issue of uh, how a law is is reflective of a demon possession. Yes, I'm quoting from Rudolf Steiner's uh, idea, or re- making reference to it, that p- politicians speak lies, but they don't call it lies. They call it platitudes. It's all up in the air. It's luciferic, airy-fairy. Uh, it's the pie-in-the-sky kind of presentation. And so people allow that. And as we know, you have pointed out that... Uh, Professor Chandler even helped create a law that said that politicians in testimony before the House or the Senate can lie. Correct. That's just a fact. If you know anything about the court system, you know that the initial brief that's presented the uh, to a court for a case is filled with lies. And that's okay because it's what the lawyer has been told by their clients, so therefore they're protected that they are assuming that their client's telling them the truth. So basically, a lawyer can lie, right? right? Now, politicians who lie know they're lying, and if they create things from the beginning, let's say that a lobbyist comes to them and says, 
we want you to lie about pipelines. We want all pipelines in America to end or to get started, one or the other. And then you're going to get money sent to the Chamber of Commerce, to your party, and it'll go direct to you, or we'll give you a direct election donation. So that person, from the beginning, if they're involved in not only then telling platitudes to people, in other words, supporting whatever the lobbyists wanted them to support, and they don't look into it, that then creates negative karma that person's going to have to pay that back. And unfortunately, because they may be speaking to a great deal of people at once on the mainstream media or other platforms, then that multiplies exponentially the karmic retribution for that platitude. Can I ask you one question? Would narratives, which is the favorite word now, would narratives be included in what you would define as lies? Yes, and the clever name narrative is nothing more than legal propaganda. And we pointed out in the National Defense Authorization Act, Obama made it legal to propagandize anyone in America or the world to basically accomplish his administrative goals. So whatever the White House goals are, you can propagandize, you can lie, you can tell platitudes. You can Okay, let me ask you a question about that. So that that's called the NDAA? Yes. The National Defense Authorization Act. Authorization Act. It's legal to lie to Americans. Okay, so at that point, did a demon enter our institution when that law was passed? Or was that a was that an executive order or a law? That was a law. It's a yearly um, budgetary uh, action that has to be taken by the House and supported by the Senate and signed by the president. So basically, it's a yearly law that mm -hmm. is reinstituted every year. But then they write in their uh, pork barrel uh, addendums and agendas and so on and so forth. And they, they put in crazy stuff into laws that no one even reads the laws. The only people who read the laws are the lawyers who work for the lobbyists who write that's they're the ones writing those laws. And so you have, if you said this to uh, the entire Congress, the only ones that would be basically directly connected with the demon from its inception, because you create an elemental being every time you create one of these thoughts, and then it goes out and it becomes an action later. So if it becomes an action, and it's not just a platitude, that's nothing like uh, Obama, what was Obama's... Uh, catchphrase, motto, something about change. He's going to bring change. Yeah, he changed, but it was for the worse. It wasn't for the better. Can so if from the beginning, if Obama knew that that was a lie that he was going to capitalize on and it was a manipulation, it was a narrative, then he's part of creating that elemental being and he then is responsible for its karma for its entire life of its existence. Okay. So and, unless so the creators call it back. Okay. Elemental being, this is a, a this is a, term I've heard you use, but <clears throat> you have said that in your past history, you um, had a particular gift and that you participated as a formal member, uh, a, a formal assistant to the head exorcist of the Roman Catholic Church. You participated in something like 800 exorcisms? Oh, I have no idea how many, a, a lot. Oh, I heard it. Okay. I don't know where I got the term, the number 800. Anyway, a lot. Okay. So, uh, and you said you had some ability to see these, these entities uh, as they were moving in and out of a person's life or presence, right? Yes. Okay. So when you're talking about an elemental being, are you talking about a demon or is this something else? Elemental beings are like sylphs. Somebody opens their mouth and speaks, then an elemental of the air is connecting with an elemental from the ether called sound ether. And they, if it has substance and it continues, it creates a being. And that being gets bigger the more people hear it, the more they believe it, or perhaps the more it upsets them. They hear it and it upsets them. That's karma, good karma, bad karma from your deeds. So when a politician is spouting platitudes, their mouth, out of their mouth is coming demons if they know that what they're saying is a falsehood. And when it's called said, a specter. When you said substance, uh, what's the difference between something that has substance and something that doesn't have substance? One is a force 
and one is the being standing behind the force. But that's a simple explanation, but uh, that's the point. The force of the speech, the sound of the speech, the articulation of the speech, whether there was warmth in what the person was saying, whether their ego was involved in it, whether they were lying to you, whether every time I heard uh, George Bush Sr. speak, demons were coming out of his mouth. I couldn't stand it. I'd run out of the room. I'd cover my ears because everything he said was a lie and he knew it. And he, it was for his own purposes, own self-aggrandizement. Excuse me. Go ahead. So that creates a specter. A specter can be seen. Specters hover around the people who tell the lies. So when someone opens their mouth in Congress and you're looking at it on TV, a lot of times you can see all these look like flies flying around them, going in and out of their ears and their eyes and their nose and their mouth. And, you know, they're, it's the Lord of the flies. It's the Lord of mm. lies. It's Beelzebub. It's, uh, you know, this it's being. one of the Babylonian demon gods. Absolutely. These are, these are forces. You're, you're using forces to create evil, dark beings that stay in existence as long as the narrative continues. Now, of course. Can I say the, something? So when he stood up there and said that these were weapons of mass destruction and we had wars and people were killed and lives were ruined, that's all on him. That's his karma. Not to say that other people won't have karmic retribution, but from that one lie, look at all the death and destruction. Absolutely. Both bushes. All lies. They knew it was lies. They killed a lot of people. They're murderers. They, they might as well put the gun to those soldiers' heads and shot them themselves. And okay, so let's talk beings. about that institution. In, in supporting that lie, did the entire of the White House, the Congress, the judiciary that did not object and did not move against that lie also uh, become uh, possessed by a demon? They were complicit, yes. Uh, possessed, perhaps not. Obsessed, possibly, but certainly complicit. And so if they... Uh, believed the lie, if they believed the specter, let's, uh, what was his name? The general, the uh, African-American general. Powell. Uh, yeah, Powell. 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 He knew that he was lying when he said there were weapons of mass destruction. He knew that. He knew that the yellow cake uranium was not there. It never was found. There was yellow cake uranium being shipped by Robert Mueller to Russia at Russia. that time, but it was not in Iraq. And uh, of course, Saddam Hussein was a, a CIA agent. And that's the reason that he knew to get so many doubles. What do you have, five different doubles? Uh, uh, and then same thing with um, Osama bin Laden. He had all these doubles. Those were CIA-made films. Each one of them had a different voice print. So what are we dealing with here? If you are part of the lie and it came out of your mouth and you knew it was a lie to begin with, you have more, you're more complicit. You have more of the karma that's upon you. If you're just somebody voting for it, well, then you're going to answer for that because uh, unwittingly, it doesn't matter that you do things unwittingly. It wasn't unwitting. You voted for war with Iraq. You voted for war in Afghanistan. You voted for the Korean War, World War I, World War II. You know, the people who got us into those are responsible for those deaths. Yes, now the second stage after specters are phantoms. So that the second you see um, Adam Schiff speak, you know it's going to be a lie because of all the phantoms that are hanging around him. He has nothing to say that isn't whispered in his ear by a phantom being to continue the lie. That's what he does. And if it's a new lie, and he's been the father of many new lies, he will have to suffer. There's a bill being put forth in the House that the $32 million Russia investigation he needs to pay 16 million of it because he was the cause of it. He said he had absolute proof, but it won't happen because we live in a country where it goes to stage three. Stage three is, uh, first off, I'd say most of the senators and uh, representatives in the House have their, their phantoms all around them. They are part of gigantic lies. They've been read into the lies. They are told it's all national security. That's wrong. They should all be whistleblowers. If you spend more than one term in Washington, D.C., and you don't become a whistleblower, 
you are eat up by spec by specters by phantoms, and then you vote for laws. And the second you vote for the law, now you can have the force of human beings, the uh, the martial military violent force, aggressive force of the military, backing you up to make sure that the laws are instituted. That's the reason they bought the IRS so many guns and so many bullets, so that they could do their evil deeds to carry out the demonic laws that Question. are passed by the House and Senate and the White Question. House. You, you make a distinction between specters and phantoms. Uh, could you describe the difference? Help us to understand the difference between those two. And it, it seems like one is worse than the other from what you're describing. A platitude rolls off people because they consider it, you know, it's a politician or it's a preacher. And then they know the preacher has an immoral life or the politician is on the take. So they platitudes roll off. Specters have more substance and they stick around until they become a phantom. And once they become a phantom, they take on more substantiality. They literally take on a pseudo physical body and a demon has a physical body. It's that written law. And the written law can then be carried out by people with guns. So you said you said that the specters. I think you described that the specters look like little ants or flies flying around people. That's mm -hmm. related to Belzebub, the demon. Yes. Okay. So and and you could see some see those. Oh yes. Could you? Wow. So <laughs> you walked around every day seeing these entities. No, that's the reason that I eventually wanted to be and became a Trappist monk. I didn't want to be expo uh, uh, exposed to these type of people or type of situations or their corporate buildings or their evil. So I went off into a monastery in southern Missouri, uh, Assumption Abbey, and wanted to stay there for the rest of my life, praying for humanity that we could get out of the Sodom and Gomorrah that we've become. Uh, so I know I didn't want that. So I would stay away from a lot of those kind of things. Like I say, but I didn't watch you did, you did see those. Oh, yes. So I, when you, I, didn't when you watch, watch TV. I didn't watch, watch TV. Yeah, I was just gonna say I didn't like watching TV. No way. Certainly didn't like anything political. Uh, straight, stayed away from reading the newspaper, that kind of stuff. I just tried to create a uh, world where I was creating uh, true, beautiful and good things and stay away from the rest. And if I did go out there, like, in today's world, it's very tough for me to go out into the world. Very tough because I see too much to this day. And it's uh, it's um, enough to make you depressed, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I interrupted you. So you've, you've got these specters and you've got these um, elemental, elemental beings, phantoms and specters. So these all seem to be stages of some element of demon possession and then you said there's an eventual demon when the item becomes law yes and that's the reason that a true possession physical things can happen they take it take, these beings negative beings take on more substantiality to the point where literally they can lift things up they can throw mm -hmm. things across the room they can do all kinds of horrible things that you can't even imagine that if you saw them you would instantaneously know one thing that's that what you've been told in school is not true. There's much more than the physical world. Other things are going on and they are substantial and they are real. So if you are uh, in, an, I could tell you things that you wouldn't believe, okay? Uh, to illustrate this, for instance, if you're standing in a blessed circle and you're holding a cross and you're saying the rite of exorcism, things get thrown at you, even yeah. though the person is strapped into the bed with straps that, you know, a, a gorilla couldn't get out of. Doesn't matter. They use their eyes. They throw things at you. They use their voice. They vomit at you. They, it, everything you can imagine, sounds come out of their body that are demonic. And what would happen? You would instantaneously know there's a devil. And then that would Im immediately tell you that there's a God and a heaven. So as soon as the devil comes out and lets the devil uh, and shows their true nature, that also then causes you to see the opposite side. That's why I always say all visionaries, I could test a visionary instantaneously. They say they had a vision of an angel. Really? What'd you see before that? If it isn't hell, then they didn't see an angel. Angels don't appear. That takes away your free will. 
they don't just appear and manifest to you to say, okay, now you don't have to have any faith. I'm going to manifest before you. Bingo, bango, there's God, there's a heaven. And you, once you have that experience, once you've met an angel, you can never go back. You can never undo experiencing the spiritual world, okay? That's not possible. People have one second of experience of the spiritual world and it haunts them like a uh, like a good spell, like uh, the Furies chasing you. It haunts you. You can't get away from it. You always keep going back to that dream, that vision, that voice that spoke to you at that moment, so on and so forth. So, you know, as soon as you see these Something demons- you never forget. You can't possibly forget that. So we experience God's uh, love uh, all the time. Uh, but so you're not referring to that. You're referring to an actual being uh, in the unseen world. Uh, and you're saying that's an interesting point you made that you never see uh, an angel first. You, an angel is presumably protecting you. That's why you see an angel. If you've encountered a demon. That's like your true. guardian angel. You're Yes, yes, your guardian angel will show up, especially if you start going in the wrong direction. <laughs> it's called your conscience. Your conscience will say, uh, you know you shouldn't be doing that. Hello? Uh, logic would indicate that you should not do that. And that's what Socrates called his daemon. But, you know, basically that's been misinterpreted. That's uh, the conscience. Beyond that is the ability to understand at the moment that you do something what the karmic consequences will be. That's the gift of the Lord of Karma. That's a gift from Christ. That's a gift of basically, it, it stands in between, it, it stands with memory and conscience as Christ's gift to us called moral inspiration comes from our heart. We, we should know at the moment that we do something, whether it's going to have good or ill consequences. Because if you're aligned with the divine, it's going to have good consequences. And if you're doing it out of selfish intent, it's going to have poor karma consequences. So if I'm wa working in Washington and I'm, I'm employed at the State Department by Hillary Clinton, and she uh, is uh, uh, engaging in all this illegal activity that uh, has, cre has been created through laws, um, for example, not just singling her out, but uh, since I have some experience with being um, a victim of her activity, um, <clears throat> you're saying that a demonic being takes over the law and anybody that's involved with it? Yes, because you can benefit from the law or you can uh, be the subject of it and it can harm you. So the, the good and bad karma created out of that law go back to the creators of it. And the more you are conscious of what you were creating, if it was evil, the more karma you're going to have for that. And, and you don't get out of that, not this life. Sometimes you create a law that goes on for a hundred years. Okay, well, even after you die, you're still getting the bad karma and you will get the bad karma for that for as long as that law continues. So let's say the, the, all these laws that are passed in Washington that have demons associated with them and those pass from generation to generation, does that demon continue to reside in Washington? Yes, and in the karmic imprint, in both the astral, the etheric and physical body of every person that it uh, affected, yes, it does. And uh, they, they love to stay in one locale, that's demons love that because then it becomes their space and they're not supposed to be in space. So mm -hmm. they start to claim it as literally unholy ground. And you can tell the second that you walk into unholy ground. Hmm. Yeah, so we've got institutional corruption and people are calling for the reform of the Department of Justice in your, in general can an institution that has been reinforced and is now funded by demons be reformed? No. You'd have to rescind all the laws and the administrative rules and the structure that created it. And the structure that created the evil in our federal agencies is the senior executive service being a replica of the British monarchical uh, aristocrats. And that has gone into the justice system, the FBI, certainly the CIA, these are all systems that are consciously created. 
evil. These are perpetrated to do evil. That's the only reason. You can't name a good thing the FBI has done. Okay, you can't name a single good thing the CIA has ever done. You can't name uh, the uh, the the Southern District of Manhattan, the, uh, the Southern District of New York courts. That's right. That or, or any of the New York courts. They are all stepping stones going down into hell. They are the road to hell. And those people who in them, none of them are. They're all complicit. There's nobody involved in these high level of uh, levels of the Justice Department, the FBI, who don't know what's going on. They'd have to be beyond ignoramuses. They couldn't have passed a test to get in to begin with, because all you have to do is watch TV, and TV will show you watch the shows, watch the movies, and they make it quite quite explicit. You're watching Homeland right now. Those things happened. That's not, you know, we're watching the end of uh, House of Cards. That all has happened. That's not made up. That's the reason they can put it on the screen. It's already happened. But once you put it on the screen, here's the deal. The devil knows that if you want to take the devil out of something, you simply make it acceptable to all the people around. So you, you dumb them down. You numb them. You make them immune to the poison. And then people can come out and they laugh and they point and they go, Oh, isn't Joe Biden satanic with all of his pedophilia? Ha, ha, ha. Nothing mm -hmm. happens. Why? Because it's been said out loud. It has diffused it. And this is one of the best tricks of the devil is to act as if the devil doesn't exist by people who are trying to worship the devil. And they're not having an experience directly with the devil because they're too stupid. Remember that Blavatsky once said, um, not all black magicians are Jesuits, just the good ones. <laughs> so the best black magicians there are fly under a false flag of Christianity. And this mm -hmm. has been known. All you have to do is look up history and you'll find it's true. And uh, some of the people, and it's beautiful because they will still say, you know, Teilhard de Chardin was a really good guy. Uh, well, I don't think so. Not if you look into what the bottom line of what he derived from his studies uh, tells you, or you can name all kinds of people who you'd say, well, but they're good. They were, they were Catholic priests, you know? No, wrong. That isn't the way it works. So you have to look at the fruit of these deeds, and that's the karma of the deeds. And so when you're looking at, uh, you can tell them by their fruit uh, verse from the Bible, how is it that you tell them by their fruit? By what it becomes. They may even think that in the beginning, and in the beginning it may have even been a good idea. Uh, for instance, uh, we were talking about ESG and the way it came about in the 60s. It was to say, we don't want to support companies that believe in big oil or believe in child labor or believe in these horrible things. Great idea. By the time it became a law, it was the exact opposite on steroids. So mm -hmm. this is what we deal with with uh, in, in the political realm. Same thing is true. Let's just take a minister. The minister who is preaching platitudes but is having illicit sex with uh, uh, children or his parishioners, male or female. The choir director. The choir director. What is that? That's about as bad an evil as you can get. Because you have somebody listening to evil words, and instead of the congregation going, I can see the evil proceeding from you, they learn to dumb that down. And pretty soon, someone like Barack Obama comes along, who does who lies about everything, including his name, his sex, his children, everything about him is a lie. Oh, he, used to, claim, he used to claim he was a Christian during the campaign. That is true. He claimed to be a Christian, though we know that he's... It, well, he's not even a Muslim. He was a Muslim, but then he was no friend of Muslims either. I think he's either. a Babylonian Rodinite. He went over. But now we to, know he went over to the economic predator dark side, and yes, that's the reason he now has five houses. Where did he get the house that he bought on a Martha's Vineyard for four point five million dollars? Where did he get that money? We know what he made as a president. We know that before that he was a, a do nothing, uh, minor politician. Where, do, where does Joe Biden get his five homes? 
and his too, some of them are multi-million dollar homes. How, how did he get that money being a good senator for all those years on that pathetic little salary? Okay, so in terms of the issue of demons related to their behavior, um, what, um, from the standpoint of exorcism, if, if you were asked to give consulting to a situation where you see a bunch of these um, uh, bureaucrats and politicians uh, promoting a particular law that you knew to be a demonic law, how do you respond or do you just withdraw? Well, you can try to fight it with the system, but as we see, you know, fighting it with the system, look what that's uh, getting Trump with his, uh, his indictment on his documents. Are we going to ignore Pence's? Are we going to ignore Biden's? Are we going to ignore Hillary Clinton's? Are we going to know every president who did that, or, uh, but we're not going to ignore Trump's? That's the kind of uh, thing you have to say. You can't, is there any hope whatsoever for the justice system, for the FBI? I don't think so. The reason is, is because I haven't said this before, but I'll let you know that Washington, D.C. was created uh, by people who were demon worshipers, Satan worshipers. As a matter of fact, one of the closest uh, things there is is to the Capitol is what the, um, uh, it's a Masonic Lodge. And, and the Masonic Lodges were all uh, preaching in those days when it was founded, uh, a, basically hegemony done by those who were the elite, those who were, who were initiated into the mysteries of the Masons. Well, so the there's a, And the Babylonians particularly. Now, all throughout Washington, there are things planted in, uh, in structures as well as in the ground that basically um, create it as a, uh, well, it basically it's an evocation circle of a, a black magician. And so it is black magic. It's just like the city of London, black magic, just like the Vatican City, black magic. Can good things happen there? They could, but they were founded for a different purpose. They were founded for control and they are responsible for the deaths of millions. And they know that basically better than the death of millions is to economically enslave them, which is what all three of those groups do and have since they were created. And it continues to this day. So they like to get places where they can build layer upon layer upon layer of evil because that makes the elemental beings that they've called to themselves stronger. So right now, can we fight against the elemental being that controls the corruption of the District of Columbia? No, we can't. We don't have anybody honest there to do that. And it, trust me, if they were honest, they would not be working for them because there's no way that anyone working for the FBI at this point doesn't know that they have nothing to do with justice. There's no one working for the CIA that doesn't know that they're working for transnational corporations. No such thing. That's not possible. Right. So if they haven't become a whistleblower, they're part of the system. And look what happens to the whistleblowers. We've seen that recently. But listen, they didn't get to a position of power unless they were read into this evil. There's no possibility of that. Mm -hmm. So you cannot tell me that someone who's a major star in Hollywood is not part of the evil that goes on there. You cannot tell me that there's an honest politician in the Senate or the House unless they're in their first term. And after that, they quit and then preached against it and made sure people understood that there is no representation, there's no republic, there's no democracy, there's no capitalism. Those are all isms created by Britain as a panacea for the masses. That's all that is. And that's what the devil does. The devil gives out the panaceas. Instead of following the seven virtues, he gives you the, the instantaneous selfish rewards of the seven vices, the seven deadly sins. And so you think this is a pay to play thing. The more you get money, the more you don't mind giving lip service to uh, to uh, mammon. The more you're a, a star that's going to be raised in the Hollywood celestial spheres, the more you've given over to Moloch. 
and the the rape of innocence, and literally physically the death of innocence. What the Moloch mysteries were all about: human sacrifice. Most of the movies are all about killing, 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 and more killing. What is that? That's numbing you down to the fact that you know what is it? Twenty six million babies have been murdered by the Planned Parenthood. So it doesn't affect you. Why? Because you've been watching Hollywood movies. You've been watching TV. You've been letting the demons stream in and out of you and say, oh, those can't control me. That is totally incorrect. It mm -hmm. controls you subliminally. It controls you in your subconscious. It controls you in your ability to make images. Every movie you watch robs you of the ability to have a strong memory based upon images. That's just a fact. Every time you use chat GPT, you become less literate, less able to write if you're using it for writing. Every time you have a machine do something for you, like a calculator, the less you know your times tables, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. This, this isn't anything, uh, shouldn't surprise anybody. So the more we give over the control of our country, to a bogus federal government that is unconstitutional, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. We should see the complete deprecation of the individual, of the I am. We should see the minority people who think they're in a democracy, who scream the loudest, get their way. That's exactly what's going to happen. Why? Because the people at the top don't scream. They're billionaire oligarchs. They don't have to yell. Whatever they say is put into mainstream media and the narrative is carried forward on a on an incredibly demonic, aramonic, satanic mainstream media, which is supposed to be the fourth estate, there for us little people so that we get the truth, so that we can have a republic and have the truth, so we can know who it is that we are voting into office to represent us. None of that is happening. As a matter of fact, the more corrupt they are, the longer they stay in Washington, D.C., which shows we don't have elections, we have selections, and those are demons that you have pointed out called Optech, and uh, all three new versions of Optech, that is a demon, and that demon has controlled our politics in America since the time of Jimmy Carter. So what do we say to these demons? First, you got to call them out. That's why we do what we do, truth history. We got to call them out. And then the, the deal is it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes. The devil is naked, okay? The devil is naked and horrible, uh, horribly obvious with the uh, inability to obfuscate the evil. So evil is blatant now. So you call it out. It you, you bring it out into the light and let the mold and the scum die because of the rays of the solar being, Christ, who is sending us these uh, the warmth, light, sound, and life of the of the sun? So you bring it into the oh, light. Wait, we're, we're, <laughs> the sun is being blotted out right now by a Canadian Prime Minister. Yes, and if you see the things that Tyler posted recently on Gab, you will notice that oh, between thirty-five to fifty fires all started at the exact same moment. Yeah, that's just that, coincidence. Uh, just a coincidence. Yeah, no, that was uh, those were set. Those were firebombed. And of course, that had to be coordinated, and they tried to do it all at one moment so that they could say it was something natural. There's nothing natural that could create that. That is not on a fault line. That is no, there's no fissural opens there. There's, there's no magma flowing to the surface. There's, uh, you can't create 50 fires at once at the exact same moment because um, I was things, being facetious. Well, I know. I'm just carrying on because now they're happening all across Canada. And yes, let's remember that the White House, not too long ago, about a year ago, came out and said, our intent is to block out the rays of the sun, no matter what we have to do. <laughs> it's like, well, these people are insane. Well, why, how could anyone guys, say that? Aren't these the same guys that are funding solar panels and wind? Yes, and there's laws that now support this. Now, there's no laws that say that uh, there are laws that uh, make you have to comply with climate change to a certain degree, the ESG uh, compliance rules, the uh, if you want to go from Fed online to Fed now, you will have to buy into carbon footprint, which is a new tax. It has nothing to do with climate. This is them playing God, acting as if they can uh, manipulate nature. 
uh, they've been manipulating nature since the 50s. And it's always been a disaster. That's the reason we have such uh, incredible droughts and then uh, floods in in California because we keep seeding the Pacific. Well, we, you were you mentioned laws, and and I think we can see how a, a demon occupies a law until that law <clears throat> no longer is applied. But what about all this ESG stuff and all this stuff the banks are doing and the corporations? How is a demon operating within, let's say, ESG? Those would be the what you've just discovered, the exact framework for how they make those calculations for by auditors or by themselves or by their uh, ESG corporate governance compliance office. And those rules, which are arbitrary, are made up by administrators, right. by really, really stupid people. And so those get passed into regulations that you must comply with and or there's very serious consequences. That's the same thing as basically a law. Okay. So it, it's almost a law. It's like all these administrative decisions done in the court that you've trained us on. So much of this is just uh, law students just carrying on with some precedent that somebody, some other law student or some stupid uh, lawyer someplace or a judge someplace said it's not law. If it was law, they would have to first say, and they don't even do this in the Supreme Court, whatever comes before them, the first law should be, is this constitutional? Mm -hmm. You know how many unconstitutional laws there are? Most of them now. We've given away our sovereignty through the U.S. Federal Reserve, through the IRS, through, through the state taxes. We've given away everything. We don't have any more constitutional rights. There's no more unalienable rights. We don't even have the right to have happiness, they only allow us to pursue happiness, but you can't have happiness because you can't own your house ever. You have to keep paying taxes on it. These are the demonic laws that enslave people from generation to generation. And because they are part of the mores, the, the social conduct of a particular country, it's considered okay. So well, we, we, we keep talking about make America great again, or that, that phrase is used a lot. <clears throat> But as we have discovered in our research, it appears that even while the revolution was occurring, Alexander Hamilton was cutting deals with the city of London to finance the first four U.S. banks that he helped fund as the first treasury secretary. And so therefore, what we see there is the demon specters of the demons from the city of London were occupying all of America's initial financing for its commerce. So that being the case, has our revolution ever not been possessed by demons? Uh, no. It, unfortunately, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, it was a political statement. It did not address slavery, and it did not address because slavery is economics, and it did not address economic slavery to Britain. We did not get out of Britain. The Peace of Paris, Treaty of Paris, True. said we still owed all debts that the British wished to assess upon us. And they had one year to come to the colonies, assess the debt, and give us that bill, which in some cases we are still paying to this very day. So, no, we were never free. The, uh, and remember, it was a Masonic uh, revolution. Joseph Warren was the uh, grand, uh, the Supreme Grand Master of the Masonic Lodges in America. Uh, uh, all the, the, well, I forget exactly how many, but many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons. It was the Masonic help that Benjamin Franklin got from uh, France that uh, in Prussia that actually helped win the day. So it was a secret Masonic war. Now at that time, the Masons. You might think, well, that's great. They got in, you know, it's like later with the French Revolution, you know, freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Well, uh, we didn't get freedom, we didn't get equality, and we didn't get brotherhood with this Masonic uh, revolution that happened. And, you know, the Green Dragon Inn and the Boston uh, Tea Party and the Battle of Bunkers Hill, that was all Masonic. The shot, uh, first shot heard around the world at Lexington in Concord, there at the bridge. What was that? That was a warning shot 
so that Joseph Warren and a couple other people could carry the list of all the Masons in America across Lexington Green because they weren't coming for the cache of weapons. They were coming for Joseph Warren's list. They were going to go after all the Masons and stop the revolution dead in its tracks. So those are what? Those are vows of secrecy you take when you join the Masons. I know I was a 33rd degree Mason and a, a high degree co-Mason, and I've studied Masonry quite thoroughly. And um, basically in the old days, it was the political force that did rule. So when you're talking about the American Revolution, people don't want to mention that it was a battle between the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. And what were those based upon? Economic laws that allowed for stockholder companies that allowed a charter to be given by the queen, an exclusive monopoly charter for things she didn't own. I mean, these are the types of evil deeds that we're talking about. They get put in writing. And then because they're in writing, people think that it had some kind of um, a moral assessment of a the effects force. of that law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it had, no. there's no moral assessment of our laws. I would have to say probably the majority of okay. laws in our modern day are immoral. You've mentioned the Masons. You've mentioned, mentioned the city of London. Um, as far as I know, the Masons were, were, were a part of the city of London well before the revolution. And are you saying the whole of Masonry is demonic? No, at one time, it was the um, it was a political machine to fight the Vatican. That's what masonry really is. It's hiding the pagan mysteries in rituals that develop a supposed morality, but it was really an insider's club for especially the royalty and the rich. And so there's a gigantic internal battle that you could go into with masonry, and it's uh, fighting uh, the Knights of Malta, uh, which, of course, subsumed the Knights of Hospitallers and the uh, Templar Knights. And the Templar Knights were an economy. Hospitallers were basically hospitals, our medical industry. And the Knights of Malta were the richest people who all got together to have their own insider track on where they're going to make their money next. So this has been going on as these old institutions. The, for instance, the Vatican is the most corrupt institution on the face of the earth, except for the Babylonian Radonites. And what did the Vatican do? They used the Babylonian Radonites for their wars because they, they virtue signaled and said that they don't believe in usury, the Catholic Church. So it went to the Jews. And so the Jews of Venice, the Jews of Constantinople, Jews. who were really Babylonian Radonites, were nothing more than an arm of the Vatican, which got rogue. And then the Vatican eventually said, well, we're going to take this power back ourselves. And they started the Vatican Bank, which, of course, is the home of the mafia. It's the home of uh, the Italian banking uh, manipulation schemes that have been going on since the time of um, the Medici and uh, the Banco family that was the first bankers in St. Mark's Cathedral. In the cathedral, remember, banks started in St. Marco, in St. Marcus, or St. Mark's, in um, in Venice, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, they were directly aligned. Matter of fact, that's how they, uh, remember, money always goes back to the temples because they were the place where they thought no one would attack. And so they would put their excess grain or their money to be protected by the church. So well, keep it, from keep the beginning... These, these are ancient institutions that have not changed one iota. Well, keeping in mind our theme, what, what role do demons play in all these institutions that you're talking about? They run them. Oh. So it's not men and women that are running them, it's demons. And the longer the institution has existed, the higher the fallen hierarchy is that controls it. Now you have literally Araman himself uh, c coming in to basically uh, claim control of this kingdom that's been built up for him for thousands of years. But you have fallen, you have even higher than fallen angels, fallen archangels, fallen time spirits. So right now, the, the fallen time spirits, the beings of the archai that are fallen, they're creating open AI. 
They're trying to destroy human intelligence. They're trying to destroy the human body through the pharmaceutical wars in all of its forms. They're trying to uh, basically annihilate human beings through war, through fake famines, through fake plagues, through fake, these are pharmaceutically manipulated. So right now you have very high beings who are laughing because they're getting very close to the brink of having, uh, for let's, let's say you believed in nuclear weapons, for having a nuclear war that could wipe out the majority of, of humanity. How happy would those beings be and how high would they have to be? If you can do that, if you can have World War III and kill billions of people, that is the sun demon, Saurat, the true antichrist. There are many false Christs. There are many false antichrists. There are many false witnesses, but there's only one true antichrist that it comes from the sun and his name is Saurat. He hasn't incarnated yet, but his Asuras are these beings who are eating up human beings so that they don't have a soul to develop into a spirit. These so that Asuras, you, you mentioned before, these are those uh, swirling um, uh, demons with no legs and they kind of look like black flies. Yes, hmm. absolutely. That's why you, you often see the black fly go into the head because it's taking over the thinking of people and eating their I am. But these are blood sacrifices. Christ came. Remember, Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Only at the last second did God stop him. Why? Because there was lots of human sacrifice at the time in that area. And so it was getting away from then human sacrifice that became animal sacrifice. And then from animal sacrifice, it became uh, sacrifice of the grain, sacrifice of their food. And this is, of course, the Cain and Abel story. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed. Cain and Abel is going on every single moment that you speak with another person. You can be Cain or Abel. Uh, and the Cain forces are Tubal Cain, later his son Tubal Cain, created then uh, smithing, working with metals, you know, working with all the substances of the earth that then could be turned into what? Tubal Cain, one of the first things he did was take a meteorite and he made a spear and a sword that were passed down through the Hebrew line, right down to Phinehas, right, supposedly by the legend, and then right down to the time of Christ, this uh, spearhead of Phinehas, forged by Tubal Cain, was the supposedly the spear that was going to stab the side of Christ. But Longinus intervened and did not want it to be an evil Longinus thing. Longinus was the centurion? Yes, Longinus the centurion with the, uh, the Roman uh, Nova Hasta that he had, uh, which, of course, we know a lot about that. Uh, and so what was supposed to become the evil weapon of the Hebrews killing a false messiah ended up becoming the spear of love, which in fact freed the spirit of Christ without having his bones having to be broken, which is what they were going to do next to him. The, the, uh, the Sanhedrin was coming out with the spear of Phinehas to stab Christ so that he would die quicker so they could take his body down before the Sabbath and so they wouldn't have to break the rules. Well, they didn't get to do any of that because why Longinus, who was blind, supposedly was the first person, one of the first people besides, of course, the three women and Mary Mother, Mary the mother of Jesus. He was the first one who said, lo, this is the son of God. And so at that point, he got his sight back because the blood of Christ went into his eye and healed him. So what are these? These are blood mysteries. What do the Christians still celebrate? Blood mysteries. It's the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's a sacrifice, the Paschal sacrifice, the sacrifice of the heavenly lamb. So you never have to make another blood sacrifice. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of followers of Moloch in our age who sacrifice people to take their blood, to put it into their blood with a transfusion so that they can stay young. That's why the evilest, richest people on the earth live to be so long. Mm. Um, in the Bible, uh, Christ encountered demons many times. And uh, it's interesting to read how he dealt with demons as, as compared to how the disciples 
and the apostles dealt with demons. And uh, it seems to me one of the big differences is, uh, as you said, our job is to tell Satan to get behind us because Christ is in our lives and has has the power. Uh, but with Christ, he actually destroyed demons, didn't he? Well, he cast them out. Okay, so, so that's the, a difference there. The question would be, what happens to them afterwards? Is he? Some would say he's casting them into the second uh, fiery lake of hell that they don't get out of, possibly. Uh, but basically, demon possession has to do with astral animal forces that get out of control. And so when you're looking at someone who's possessed, sometimes their face takes on the visage of an animal, like beyond your imagination, you actually think there is a wolf inside of that I mean, body. Their, their physical features change and they look like an animal? Yes. And you've encountered that? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, that's sometimes how you can figure out who the demon is if he won't tell you his name or her mm -hmm. name. And so Christ cast out the astral exaggeration, could have been an obsession, could have been a possession uh, of people who had uh, basically, uh, for instance, he cast them into pigs. Why? Because the pig is the closest thing to the astral body of that person he just exercised. They were probably uh, into materialism and wealth and gold and harming other people for the sake of gaining money. And so, or let's say that it was the uh, being of Asmodeus, the uh, woman who had uh, uh, multiple demons in her because of her sexual transgressions. You know, well, what happens then? What did, what did uh, Christ say to them when they wanted to stone her to death? Let, let ye without sin cast the first stone. And what happened? Nobody cast the stone. So where did he cast that demon? Well, that demon, at the moment that she acknowledged that it was that demon, knew the demon's name, knew, knew the sins, and she turned away from them, that demon starts to fizzle right before your eyes hmm. because the creator of it, ended it and that's the whole point with that a bad law you have so, to end the, the bad law so that's that's repentance that's uh what's the greek word metanoia metanoia it's turning around yes matter of fact that's what christ said uh, heaven is all around us metanoia turn around change your ways you'll see it hmm. and so you know even when they were being martyred they weren't in suffering. They were happy to suffer for their beliefs. They were happy because they were literally seeing heaven right before them as they were burning at the stake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, casting out demons, you know, like uh, Father Gabrielli, complete nonsense. Uh, and that's the Who's reason that, that uh, the one that they did the movie on, the Pope's Exorcist, uh, the Exorcist. Oh, that's that, that the new that movie. I, yeah, that I complain about, Gabriel uh, Amroth. Uh, he is a complete sensationalistic, should be Hollywood star because everything he said was wrong and everything he did was wrong. You know, 70,000 cases of exorcisms, he says, and he only had a few successes. <laughs> well, he's not very good at casting. Well, that, that, that's puzzling because why would any exorcist want to be, uh, want publicity, want to become famous for this particular gift? Would a real exorcist want to no, absolutely have that not. notoriety? No, his teacher, uh, Amaniti, wasn't known by anybody. He was practically a secret. No, mm. you wouldn't want that. That's the last thing you'd want because that would just draw more demons to you and then you'd have to get them out of yourself before you could help somebody else get them out of them. So basically the reality is, is priests are very lonely, messed up people. Okay? Roman Catholic priests, very weird, asocial, alcoholic, uh, sexually messed up people who can't make it in the world. That's why they joined the Catholic Church. Many times they, like Ratzinger said, he joined the Catholic, Ratzinger, you know, Pope, the previous mean, Pope. Uh, God's Rottweiler? Yeah, God's Rottweiler, uh, the a Nazi Pope, said he wasn't a Catholic. He joined the Catholic Church because they had food. Yeah, that's literally a lot of the priests can't make it in the world. And so they go into a, a, an institution that, that takes care of them and takes away their I am. You don't have any freedom 
when you go into the church or when you go into the military, uh, the U.S. military? Well, I, you know, I, I let me ask you. I, I've known a lot of very manly priests that uh, uh, are very holy, godly people. In and the I'm Russian, not, I'm not Roman Catholic. In the Eastern no, Church, it, no, I'm talking about Roman Catholic. Well, you should introduce me to one of those. I'd like to see one. Okay. Because I've known thousands. And I can say that 99.9% uh, .9 of them were messed up. Every once in a while, you come across a saint, though. You do. You mm -hmm. can. You do. Padre Pio was a saint. Uh, uh, Cardinal Salinas, I mean, uh, Father Salinas here in Detroit was a saint. Uh, I believe Mother Teresa is a saint. I met her, and I definitely believe that she had that feeling of saint. My aunt, who just died, uh, 98 years old, she was a Carmelite nun or a pink sister, they're called went into the uh, uh, convent at 18 and stayed there her whole life and was a holy, beautiful person. There are there are people who can use any institution right. and make it holy, that you right. bring holy ground. This institution doesn't bring you salvation. Right. It's, it, it, it's a place where you as a human park your activities. Yeah, so your I, feet, I agree with that. Your feet create the holy ground. It's like in the Russian church, uh, your, the church you go to, they stand on these little carpets so that, you know, basically they are kept from the evil of the earth coming up into them. And so they create holy ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Catholic church doesn't do that. The Catholic church is convinced that they should sell indulgences, that only priests can forgive your sins, complete insanity. That part, that's complete nonsense. No priest can forgive a sin. Only Jesus Christ, the Lord of karma can forgive a sin. Uh, they shouldn't have control of your life. They shouldn't make you tie. They shouldn't, you know, tell you what your morals should be when they are, they don't have morals themselves. So, but with the churches that you allow, in, in a, in, I don't, I'm not trying to be funny about it, but in a different way, that's another type of ESG system. Absolutely, absolutely, and as long as you're in compliance at the podium. You can rape it when you want. Whenever, whenever that uh, I used to be an evangelical, and uh, there was a there was a movement called the discipleship movement. And one of the things that I found that the leaders of that group all, often got into was uh, having authority over other people. And <laughs> whenever I encountered that, I said, "Hey, guy, I didn't get that memo. I'm out of here." Yes, well, that's what I do too, and that's why I can't find a church to go to. <laughs> Because, you know, you go there and you just listen a while and you go, holy cow, that person does not believe what they're saying. And they're preaching it from the podium and acting as if they're more self-righteous than you are. And you should do what they say. It's like, no, I'm the, not going to do that. The path of salvation is, is, uh, is quite, uh, quite a challenge for all of us. So uh, just to close off this question on um, <clears throat> exorcism. Uh, okay, we've got a... a diabolical system in Washington, D.C., London, uh, the Vatican, and other major cities. Um, what do we as individual Christians do about that? Well, you do what Noah did. You prepare your bio arc, or you do what Lot did. You keep your family in your house. You keep them away from the evil. And when the angel comes to save you, to declare that you're the remnant, just like they did with Noah or with uh, Lot with Enoch, with Melchizedek, with any of them, you be ready to be translated into heaven. Now, translated into heaven is about your perception. It's not about taking your physical body to a place. So it's about you preparing. It's as Christ said, if you wish to really cast out the demons or uh, you have to uh, pray and fast. And pray so you fast. have to pray and fast and you have to extricate yourself. You have to pull yourself out of the pit. And so the swamp, you know, the, the deal is with the swamp in DC, draining the swamp is just going to make the alligators come out of the swamp and eat you. Okay. You can't drain the swamp. You, it's, that's impossible. You would have to go back to the fact that it was not founded properly and that you have elemental beings in the laws with force that is being backed up by lots of people with guns. And you have to say, this was improperly created. We now mm -hmm. need to go back to its original idea, and then do it again, but this time in the do-over, make sure that the federal government only has power inside of its little sovereign area of D.C. No, they should be able to have any decisions about anything except what happens in D.C. They don't 
determine what happens in states. There should be no federal courts. There should be no federal agencies that have power over state courts or, as I've always said, it goes back to the sheriff. This is about grassroots. This is about Mm -hmm. working from your own area, working with your neighbor, working with your community, working with the sheriff, not allowing the feds to come in. And then we need to basically cancel the laws that were created in 1913, which again, all are unconstitutional for the IRS, for Social Security, for the uh, Federal Reserve, for so many of these things that were put into place. And now they keep being uh, again and again, ratified again and again. And every time they're ratified, that demon in those laws becomes bigger. So the only way to stop those demons is to stop the laws and basically go back to the original idealistic founding of America, but be prepared to do it differently this time. It can't go to the power of banks. It needs to go to the power of landowners. We need Mm -hmm. to be able to own property. And can that happen? Yes, it can. Will it happen? Uh, I'm afraid we'll see the fall of Western civilization before any of the vested powers will uh, let loose of any of the reins of power that they have. Well, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep working at reformation or um, replacement. Absolutely. And people, I love to say this because I'm a historian, history has nothing to do with battles and dates or rulers. It has to do with individual biographies one single human being time and time and time again through their efforts moral efforts and their love have transformed the world individually and that's what we have to do we have to be the homeopathic remedy the itsy bitsy teeny tiny particle that is the crystal that others can then crystallize around and follow that example so the only thing you can really do is be a good example to everybody in your environment and make sure that your eyes are upon the goal. And that goal is the ascension back to the place that we came from, which means heaven, or as it's called, New Jerusalem, where we take the old Eden and make a new Eden, and we build our celestial mansions every day from our moral love of others that is being literally turned into the next world that we will live in. Wonderfully said. Now we've gone over time. So I'm going to thank you for uh, sharing out of your heart. And uh, let's pick this up later. Thank you.